Great. And I also do the transcript. Uh, we do closed captioning. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants closed captioning, but from the transcript, if we need to make any kind of notes, we are able to do it that way too. So it's a really handy feature we found in Zoom. So welcome everybody. Um, tonight, we're going to have a deep dive with our guest from Seattle Department of Transportation, Patty Quirk. And um, she had done a webinar presentation September, I think, okay, August or September, where um, they spent an hour going through what is the Department of Transportation's response plans for an earthquake. And um, we have not talked about transportation for quite a while. About six years ago now, um, Lawrence Ike Eichhorn had done a in-person presentation for us down at the Seattle Central Library, where he took people who were not familiar with earthquake response plans through kind of the thinking at the time. So since they did the whole webinar, it seemed like a perfect time to, you know, let's close the cycle and come back and see if anything's changed. And we have a, a lot of new hub captains since then, and it's good for them to be able to catch up on what the thinking of Department of Transportation is. So I'd asked folks to try and watch the webinar in advance because it was a pretty high level about what's going on. And we often have highly detailed plan questions and making our own neighborhood unique plans, as you can see from the questions we sent. And I got one or two more in since then, but they're in a similar vein to what we'd already talked about, Patty. So it should be no surprises. So for just kind of admin stuff, I'm asking folks to put your name and your hub in the chat, just in case there's any follow-up and I can go, you know, who all was on that, you know, said that, that I should send this out and that sort of stuff. So please go ahead and do that for me. And did anybody, just so I know, was there anybody who had additional questions that you've kind of got percolated or should we talk first and come to those? Anything you guys had that you wanted to talk about in general too? This is good if you're kind of like, you know, let's go, let's, let's start having the discussion. So Patty, um, you wanna summarize anything you'd like to say, or, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to you and then we're just gonna have a dialogue. And yeah. we're all really used to the Zoom meeting format, so that should work. I'm just so excited not to be trying to run a PowerPoint at the same time. <laughs> and I do, if I'm looking off to the left, I do have a second screen up that had the questions that, that Cindy sent me earlier. Um, but uh, yeah, so I also live in West Seattle and it has oh. been a very busy day. Uh, we started our response about 2.30 this morning um, with all of the trees and things, um, but I'm still happy to be here. So if I'm not on my A game um, and I don't get to your questions, we, I will certainly follow, follow up with you. Um, so one of the things I think that's unique about earthquakes and the questions that you might have neighbors, neighborhood specific versus like a snow response is there's really a lot of unknown with earthquakes. We have several different faults that run through the city. You know, there's magnitude, there's durations. There's a lot of factors that, that go into what is it going to look like in your neighborhood, including aftershocks and um, what does that look like? So I know that one of the um, questions that Cindy had asked is about walking routes. Um, like how would you get from point A to B and did I have any advice for that? And my advice for that, again, it's a very, it's very individual to where you are is to really um, figure out your route yourself, a couple of different routes. Can you get from A to B without going over a bridge, for example? Or um, can you walk through a, um, area that doesn't have it. Is everyone familiar with unreinforced concrete masonry buildings? They're the old ones. You see them a lot in Ballard and West Seattle that um, are known to be susceptible to earthquake damage. If you think about the you know, Squally quake and we saw what happened in Pioneer Square. So it's finding that route where you would be trying to avoid those and avoiding any bridge that you might come across. Um, and I would come up with a couple of those. And again, it, it, it's really, and, and just do it, do it with your family, you know, do it as if, if you're on your team meetings, whatever it is, and kind of come up with that. Because there's, as soon as I say that there would be one option, that option is, is not going to be available again, because there's just so many different, different variables. So that's what I would recommend on the question of, of routes. Um, and one of the questions too that Cindy had sent me is the difference between bridges. I just talked about bridges and tunnels. So there are, uh, for example, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with closed the West Seattle, a section of the West Seattle Bridge in uh, March, right after the governor shut the, the, shut the state down with COVID. And people then tend to think of that as one structure that's actually multiple structures. So there are tons more bridges in the city than you, than you would probably think about, including the whole I-5 um, infrastructure through the city is just one bridge after another bridge after another bridge. So it's really a, a structure that is above ground and you might not, it doesn't have to pass over water or ravine or, or anything like that. It really has to do with the topography in the city. And then the difference between, of course, then a tunnel would be something that would be underground or, or under the water. And the first thing, well, the two things that come to mind in Seattle are the new uh, 99 tunnel, which is the safest actually facility in the city at this point infrastructure. It was built to the highest and, and best standards. And then the on the opposite end of that spectrum is the Burlington Northern tunnel that runs through um, downtown that's say turn of the century structure, um, concrete or pardon me, brick structure that has not, not been retrofitted at all. Um, and the, I think the important thing to remember too about bridges is we've had a very generous levy, series of levies that the public has voted for in Seattle and we have been systematically retrofitting our bridges. And what that means is it doesn't mean that those bridges will be usable. We are retrofitting to failure, meaning collapse. And washout is very similar in, in the design approach. So when I say working around bridges, it really does mean there's probably not a bridge in the city that's not gonna have damage to it. It's gonna be varying degrees of damage. So really trying to avoid any bridge and figuring out what that, that would look like to walk around. Um, that said, it's highly likely that um, many of our bridges will be usable for pedestrian traffic, let's say, or bicycles, which have a lot less uh, load than vehicles. Um, and so that's not that eventually they're, they're not gonna be, um, as we go through a long recovery period, available at all, but it's just really going to be unknown. And it's going to take us a while. We have 140 bridges in the city that we're responsible for, and that doesn't count the bridges that WashDOT and the county also have. So you can imagine it's going to take a while to look at all of those. And then every time there's an aftershock, we will then have to go back and, and look at them. So that's why I really say try and avoid, try and plan your route to avoid bridges. Yes, Cindy. Yeah. So let's, let's, be specific then. So you're going to have someone who comes out and does a bridge inspection and we'll get back to the, is it open or closed until the inspection's done? Mm -hmm. But let's say I see a bridge, it, it looks open, there's no closed placard on it. So I'm going to go across it. If you have inspected that bridge and closed it to road traffic, but you're leaving it open to pedestrian and bikes, Will you mark them like that? Or how will we as community people who are trying to know what that is, yeah. Get the hyper-local information out to our neighborhoods know? Yeah, I mean, certainly. And and the thing with the inspection is you have to realize um, our an initial preliminary inspections are can we visually see any damage, right? Can we see buckling? Can we see pieces falling off? And if you think about what happened in the West Seattle Bridge, all of that damage was internal to that structure. It wasn't visible, and so it would take a while for us to even get to where we can actually do a thorough inspection of all um, bridges. Once we get that done, but yeah, we will certainly have identified which bridges are safe to use, whether it's for emergency vehicles, lifeline, pedestrian travel. And um, we will certainly be focusing on connecting um, community hubs, points of distribution, and then uh, Washout has identified 520 is there ingress and egress out of the city. 520 as well as the um, the viaduct tunnel are they are actually built to withstand an earthquake and be usable versus that collapse that I talked about. Yes so and we, we learned watching your your thing I relearned terms. Life mm -hmm. safety means it's not going to fall but essential standards means it will actually be usable and that's only um, the Alaska tunnel or the Alaska viaduct tunnel and 520 <laughs> we have right. two in the city right um and, it, and a lot of times too what happens if you've followed any of the of the uh things that have happened in Kobe and Christchurch is even sometimes if the bridge is okay it's the approaches mm -hmm. that fail because as things move so you might have a standing bridge but you actually uh, <laughs> can't cannot use it if you so can get up to the bridge you could cross it yeah. Frank had his hand up 
Yeah, I I sat through it again today, and it was really informative. And just if if you uh, um, could reconcile two phrases, uh, the mm -hmm. WASDOT life safety standard does not fall down, and then retrofit to failure collapse. So how do I explain that to the general public at a council meeting if those two phrases come up? Because I don't know how to reconcile them. Yeah, so, and just full disclosure, I am not an engineer. I'm not a bridge engineer. On the presentation, we had a bridge engineer. I'm, a, I'm an emergency manager, although I've worked with SDOT for, for 20 years. So, to, and I will be happy to follow up uh, with you all with uh, engineer to prove language that I would feel more comfortable with you sharing. But the gist of it is when we retrofit infrastructure that is old, we are retrofitting it to prevent failure. And by that, that means collapse. Okay. That's the difference. And almost all of our infrastructure in the city that the city owns that I'm responsible for is very old. And if it has been retrofitted, it has been retrofitted just to the standard of it will not collapse. As far as we know, you know, as, 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 as best as the engineers have told us with retrofitting does not mean that's usable. Do we have any bridges that have not been retrofitted and are at risk for collapse? Just We just know that they're probably going to go down? So um, when the West Seattle Bridge was closed, we did do an extensive report for city council on the status of, of the bridges. Um, I can't, I mean, with 140 of them, I, again, I can't tell you which will do what and, it, and with each earthquake being so different and what it would look like. So when I talk to the director of our, our roadway structures, uh, Matt Donahue, and I say, hey, what is your best, like for planning purposes, yeah. what would you tell me to tell people? And again, my whole family lives in the city too. So it's telling myself, he's like, don't plan on using any bridges. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, we tend to think about uh, alternatives, right? Mm -hmm. So if I knew five bridges to get out of West Seattle, we're not retrofitted at all. I probably wouldn't even send someone to go look at those, but I might send right. someone to go look at the retrofitted ones. You That's, know, I, I sure yeah. wish that, that it was as, as linear because I've had this conversation again. I've been with ESTA um, 20 years, like, well, where's the list and all the retrofitted? The thing is not to get too engineering. Uh, we started retrofitting bridges in the 80s. Okay, and since the 80s, we are now in 2021. What it looks like to retrofit something, mm -hmm. what that means, means something different. So okay. it's really hard to say, these are retrofitted, we know that they're gonna be good. We know that there's ones that haven't been retrofitted. What I will see, uh, what I can do is find the, the report that we did for city council. Um, it's, I'm sure it's very long and, and tedious, but I would feel more comfortable using that as a reference. Um, okay. We just have so many, and again, it's like we started retrofitting actually in the late 70s, early 80s, and it really means it, it just changed what it what it looks like. Okay. Um, well, I have and a it, juicy treat for everybody at the end of this because, uh, as part of Cascadia Rising, the state mm -hmm. has given everybody the link to their bridge analysis. So we'll kind of take a look at that because I'm I'm my primary thing is to to find a route that doesn't use any bridges, and so mm -hmm. that's what I can bring the tool up and go, hey, I can get to this point or this point or this point. And here are my no bridge routes. So I'll show you guys that at the end. You can, but they did not analyze Seattle bridges. Their analysis is only of washdot infrastructure. Oh no! Yeah. I mean, no wonder I looked at West Seattle and went, "Oh, right on! Yeah. We can get to Highline." Yeah. So it is okay. only so it's we only their, both of those. It's only those their infrastructure um, that they that they looked at. Do you does have it, does, a interactive map of Seattle mm -hmm. bridges? Uh, we don't have one. We don't have we don't have a similar uh, map. Uh, the state spent a lot of money and resources and consultings to actually get to that um, mapping system that they have. Do, do so you we, just even have a map? I mean, not, not even rated, just of all your bridges. Yeah, I mean, we have a map of all of our a GIS layer of all of our bridges. Yeah, that's what we would want then. Okay, yep. so let because me write. Then this I can down. we can use we can use the states. Can't, cause I don't think the county owns any bridges, right? I hope to God not. They do. In fact, one of the major uh, issues that we had is for us in West Seattle, the worst, first avenue South Bridge, South Park Bridge, last weekend in the storm was out. That is actually a county bridge. It is not a city bridge. 
Um, it's one of the newer bridges in the city. And so theoretically it would do really great in an earthquake, but it is actually a county facility. It's not a city city bridge. So for us to be, and remember Patty, our context is we're not really hearing from the city for three days, you know, just because that's when you guys are doing your windshield surveys and all your long, it could be it could be longer. Well, I know that, but it, I kind of yeah. you know like people can grasp if I go for three days. We're talking to yeah. our neighbors and we're we're on our own. So the more right. we know of our neighborhoods mm -hmm. in advance, the better. So the tool we need to be able to talk options in our name in all of our different neighborhoods about routes besides doing besides saying don't go over a bridge and I have a neighbor go well where what does are that mean bridges right yeah. we need an integrated map of state county and city bridges on one map so I can go here's West Seattle or here's Morgan Junction and I go. think that's a start the other thing that you need and um, the Office of Emergency Management can help you with that is we have this um, one concern um, who has done a lot of modeling based on real earthquakes, because you're also looking at liquefaction. Landslides are a big secondary um, event after earthquakes, so are fires. And um, then again, the unreinforced concrete masonry buildings that I mentioned. So um, I know it's hard, and I, and I commend you all for the work that you are doing in your, your neighborhoods. It's just, it bridges is just one piece of it. Oh yeah, I know that. That's, that's why you're deep dive number 14 here. <laughs> we have um, we six or seven of us have one concern accounts. Oh, perfect! So you can and see what the blocks. I had not done like. the map infrastructure layer yet, yep. so we will go in and probably yes. produce sector level maps. Hear that, everybody? I see four of you on here who have one concern accounts. And when you look at it, it, it it's it's based on census, so it's not it's not quite as current as we would would like with like density of buildings and and so forth. Right. But just um, to get the maps, but just to get that the is the one place where all the integration is currently existing. I'll go there. Yeah, I mean, and it does show you like uh, it's easy to look at by colors. Like the darker color, the more potential damage there is. For example, um, so I think that's really, really helpful. Yep, a helpful place to start. I'll Patty. be talking at the end of the deep dive. I'll be talking about the presentation we're going to give using one concern to our West Seattle communities as a starter guinea pig place. So I, I saw Mar Frank's already Margaret? asked one. So Margaret nope. and then Frank. Yeah, I um, am curious, Patty, you made the comment that I-5 is a series of bridges and I live in East Lake, so um, mm -hmm. we, we can certainly see them, many of them. Um, I'm just curious, does, did you, did I hear you say that the wash dot bridges are not in on any of these maps? Because I just want to know how far down. I mean, is it just the entire I-5 going by us or is some of it sitting on ground? We have plenty of bridges between us and anybody else, but. So a couple parts of that question. Any map that I gave of bridges would be city infrastructure. Yeah. Which is kind of a pain, right? Because it doesn't deal with the county. Um, as far as I know, I mean, I can check to see if we have any any other ones. And what Washdot said, if you were able to make it through that that whole very long uh, earthquake presentation, is that they are not expecting I five through the city to be usable at right. all. Right. I just um, want to know if we can get. I mean, so, I've been trying to figure out how we can cross five. And yeah. Get, yeah. Yeah. So let me so, bring up. Um, let me share my screen with that Washdot map. Okay. And you can see what it looks like, and then maybe that'll help Patty go that segments or, you know, so hang on, Frank, just hang on to your question if you don't mind. No problem. And, and while, while you're bringing it up, so um, that is a big question that we asked too, is how can we cross? Where will we be able to cross? And that will certainly be a um, level of focus for us. And so we think about things that are just um, as basic as, hey, we got big equipment, we're going to push that, let's say James Street and 6th when we need to get to the hospital. We're going to push all that rubble together and pave over it and just like a, make a little, like whatever we can do uh, to get those connections going as, as soon as possible, we will do. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out if we can do some kind of rope bridge across five because we it, it dips down uh, as it goes by East Lake. Mm -hmm. um, so here's, yeah. so like if you click on each of these dots. Okay. It will tell you, you know, State Route 5, but 
so you can see on this one, you know, I just zoomed in on this, you know, like they've got yeah. multiple dots. Now this is where the indicator is repair type new bridge over water, you know, so it's like that must be the start of the ah. Uh, so, so this is where they expect the damage, I think it is. So it answers the question of, no, there isn't a map that goes segment, 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 segment. It just shows you where the probable damage segments are. Yeah, that's where it's elevated really high. There's a park underneath it. So that's what it looks like okay. you know, for the city. See, see why I was so happy? I was like, oh, look, West Seattle, no bridges. My brain really didn't drive around in my head and go, no, that's not really realistic. Okay. So well, we'll have uh, to... we do have bridges in West Seattle that you don't think about, like on, on Admiral coming up at different places, yep. but yep. Yep. Um, yeah. So we'll get that, I'll get that one concern. We'll see if we can yeah. see if we, how that works for us okay. to give to everybody. So we have in our hub captain book to go, here's all your bridges, you know, figure out a way to get to hospital or critical infrastructure or the sea pod or whatever without using one of these routes. And Anybody so, um, else got a question about this before I stop sharing? Sorry. I'm going to send the link out to you after this so you can play. Thanks. Um, what One of the things, again, to keep in mind, too, which um, I, I, I was a, a young child in California. We had earthquakes all the time. Like, we had our heads under the desk. And so I was really surprised when I, um, although I've lived here for 20 years, I didn't really realize that the science of earthquakes, if you will, is a lot newer um, than other sciences. And this had came out of the magnitude, the M9 studies that UW uh, had funded a few years ago, if you are familiar with that, that really looked at that magnitude nine. And so sitting through some of those lectures, I was really surprised. I didn't realize how new the study of um, earthquakes really is. And so when you like, there's a lot of these, these questions that you, that you think that we should have answers to and, and we don't. And um, the city, obviously, we are, um, this whole year we've, we've spent focusing on earthquakes. One of the, the big things that, that this Cascadia 22 was supposed to be focusing on was transportation and infrastructure, because that came out of the, the need to focus on that came out of the um, 2016 exercise. Unfortunately, because of many things going on in the country, uh, um, that ex the federal exercise is going to be scaled back. We just don't know what that that looks like, and so we're still trying to figure out um, how can we get the most out of that exercise. Because again, we just said we've got city and county infrastructure, or pardon me, county and state infrastructure, and the feds are involved. And so, really looking at at how do we get the most out of that. Because one of the questions that um, Cindy had asked, which is is a very good question, is like, what um, resources will we be able to call in? Like Bailey Bridges, those are the, the Corps of Engineers. You'll see the, the red horse that they come in in different places and, and set up bridges. Um, and we were hoping that we would kind of get to that in, in 2022. Oregon is way ahead of us um, in, in that work. In fact, that they've already identified what the military where it's possible to land and install bridges. And this is based on a Cascadia exercise, of course, where the coast is going to be more impacted. So we have, a, we have um, some potential sites, um, Ballard Fremont area that, that might work, but it really, it, 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 the, it, the um, Corps of Engineers has not come in and done a, a full assessment and said, yes, we wanna put a bridge there. We're definitely pushing for that because the more we can have those sites predetermined and approved, if you will, like the quicker we're going to try to get those those resources um, in. And then, then there's only a finite number of those resources um, in the city. Having said that, our priority in an earthquake response is to first we're going to support the fire department who's the lead agency, but it is to make connections as quickly as uh, possible to not only fight fires, but to provide access to um, medical services and then any like shelter and food and anything anything along those lines. And so we're, we are certainly not where I, I would sleep better at night if we were, <laughs> but we are, we, we are constantly moving forward. Um, to, to, yeah, it, we're just 
making those incremental it, steps. It's, yeah. it's a never ending planning exercise. So it is. Well, and one of the things that we're working on right now too, just citywide, just, just so you know, is that we don't have a universal damage assessment tool that all departments would use. Uh, so we're really trying to figure out what does that look like? So what that means is that if, um, so SDOT, uh, we are, we are not 24 seven in the way that police and fire are, for example, we have very light uh, staffing overnight because we do most of our work in the daylight hours. So in the event that an earthquake happens overnight on the weekends, um, police, fire, you know, utilities, other city agencies are going to be gathering information probably much faster than we're gonna be able to. But how they report that information is it's like different for everybody. And so we're really trying to figure out what is the what is, what is the best way for us all to speak the same language and use the same tool and really maximize that effort. So when um, SDOT gets rolling, we are not looking at the same thing that the police, fire, you know, whoever has already looked at. So we're really like that's like our number one focus is to to get that done because it, it doesn't exist right now. That was the brief conversation with you and Lucia about survey one two three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking at looking so at hub that. captains, you know, the tool that we use to do our, our, you know, what's in your business area, the survey, they, that's what they're kind of talking about is that, that type of tool for all departments to collect their information. So if it's as simple as survey one, two, three, if we are, if, if for some reason they want to get information from us, then that's how we could contribute to situation awareness much easier than it's all over ham radio or whatever. So Frank and then Anne's had her hand up too. Um, before you get there, and I will get to Frank and Anne, is, is I just want to say in any um, disaster response, the there are um, uh, um, social media and what people see is hugely important. And there are applications that collect that and then um, validate it like, hey, one person said something, okay. That's, that's interesting. Five people have said the same thing about the same thing in their photos. So we can now um, you know, elevate that as like really good situational awareness. So the eyes on the street of, of you all and, and the people that you work with is hugely important as far as situational awareness goes. So um, I'm sorry, was Frank and then was it Anne? Yeah, I, the question I have is sort of from the, uh, the citizen perspective. How do we know when these bridges are usable given, uh, how do we get the information? I have an idea, but um, there's there's initial shocks, there's aftershocks, mm -hmm. there's assessment, the whole thing. And people yeah. at the chambers and these other places are gonna be asking, how do we know when they're accessible? Uh, because when the, when the Magnolia Bridge needed a repair, I was ready to walk up it because the newspaper said on their front page, you can walk up it. And the cop at the place said, no, you can't go up it. So even though the information was out there, it never really got out to the, to the, to the police department. But I think that's one of the questions sort of on the ground for people. How, do, how does a civilian who's not involved in what we're doing get informed on the ground truth of what's happening there in a highly fluid situation? Yeah. And, that may be so, longer than we need to get into now. Well, I think there's a couple important things there. So what our code says, and I actually think it goes back to the revised code of Washington, is that everything is considered, um, and I, I don't want to confuse the movable bridges, the opening bridges. Mm -hmm. Every bridge is considered, um, let's say, usable until it has been determined to be not usable. OK. So having said that, you know, I just told you guys to avoid bridges. So I would I would take Don't that depend on bridges. <laughs> it, it really depends on like what you can actually see going on in, in front of you, right? Um, and so I think that's important to 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 clarify. Um, and that we will we're still working on the best way to once we formally close something, what does that look like? Um, the old plan said that the police department is going to go out and they're going to put traffic control officers out there. You know, this was even years ago. That wasn't sustainable then. It's certainly not sustainable now. So we're looking at everything from taking our electric vehicles that, that we have many of that might not be um, able to be recharged and actually blocking off bridges. Um, so people, because people tend to go around little barricades. So we're, we're trying to think of everything that we can do that is not heavy with um, resources that would actually close something. So there's that piece. Then there's the second piece. When you're talking about the movable bridges, those that open and close, mm -hmm. 
Can I, before you go on, mm -hmm. be, because I just, I'm just trying to get the, the whole picture here. So let's say you had a bridge that is blocked to traffic. You put a mm -hmm. car in front of it, no car is going to go around it, but it is still open to pedestrians or bikes. Yeah. How do we know that? Well, we, uh, we would, signage? we would want to sign it. Yeah. We would want to have a, um, a sign up indicating that it is open. And it might be in the early days, just simple, simple, something simple as um, green paint, red paint, right? So a lot of our bridges have the um, pedestrian access on the sides. It could be something just as simple as, because we're running out of signs, like we spray paint green in the ped zone or bike zone um, so that people can look and see, okay, this is, this is okay. Um, and a lot of what will happen, quite frankly, is we'll try things and then we'll constantly make improvements as, as we go along. But our, it, we are the business of, of my department and then the city is to quickly communicate reliable information to you all in the public. I mean, as fast as we absolutely can. I mean, like that's like yeah. super high, high priority for us. How, what that will actually com completely look like if we're talking a catastrophic earthquake, I honestly, I, I, can't, I can't tell you that. That's, um, that's why the more we can learn what you intend, not what, mm -hmm. you know, the plan never survives, right? Yeah. But because we know Como Cairo, they're reporting regional, right? They will talk about pancake buildings or, pan, you know, one bridge incessantly, and we will never know that green means go, <laughs> you know, you you know what I mean. So well, it's, so it's I've worked messaging. on I've worked on um, many disasters from Katrina to the Oso slide, uh, and and so here's and I see you, Anna, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of quickly answer this, and the open close and the move won't get to you. So in the event of those big disasters where communication is 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 um, an issue, um, hopefully you've all heard of the incident management system. It's what FEMA uses. We all use it. Incident management teams. So um, the public information officers run what's actually called trap lines. And what a trap line is, is there are, are uh, places that are developed all through neighborhoods where it's just simply a piece of plywood. And if it's bad weather, like for us, it'd probably have an overhang that, that, that people go, incident management people will go out and continually post any updates to the public and they know where they are, whether it's a point of distribution where they get food or water. So they're strategically placed where people naturally gather. And that is like, that is a tried and true method of communication that has used over, over and over again. But Seattle so, has never talked about trap lines, ever. It, it's just, it, that's a colloquialism. That's just what the public information officer, but they, they did it up at OSO. And so that's where all the information people know. And there is again, conveniently located where you don't have to uh, cross a bridge or anything. You're already going to get your water or other assistance and you're gonna see a big piece of plywood and there's, and you're gonna know that that's where actual things are posted, physically actually posted. And that is something that um, is just, has, is, is used all the time in disasters where communication um, is, is either unreliable or it's hard to get out. And also those continue to be used actually after even radio and other things come up. It's just because people get used to seeing it as very neighborhood specific. Um, and before I get to Anna, I just want to say too, again, the movable bridges, the difference in open and close for them. So um, maritime traffic is the priority over street traffic. Right. It's federal law. And also, if you think about it, in the case of a earthquake where our roads might be screwed up, we're going to really want our waterways opened, right, to bring in resources. So when you talk about a movable bridge and you say it's open, it is actually open. Mm -hmm. It is open physically open, the structure is lifted or, and for maritime traffic to come through. And I totally get that that is confusing. Yeah, we, uh, that, that's consistent with what we've been told before, which is they would default to being in the upright position. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we know we were told which ones were manually movable should you lose power yeah. that could go down, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just wanna clarify that. Anne, you've been so patient. Yeah, thanks. Um, so a couple, couple easy questions, I think. Uh, do your traffic cameras have battery backup? Um, some of them do, and not all of them do. So for example, in the last um, storm, gosh, was it just last weekend? Um, so 
we there was actually a situation where some of the signals were out on MLK and Othello, and the situation was that is a train crossing, so on transit is crossing, and not all of those had battery backup. So we're in the process of, of getting enough in strategic areas because it would take a while for battery backups. But at this point, I um, I would say a low percentage of them actually have battery backups, which is okay. why when there's a storm and you pull up the city light map and it shows all the red, you can almost look at that and say all of the signals are out in those areas as well. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Sorry, I should have started with the bridge ones first. Um, are you using or contemplating using drones to assess bridge stability after mm -hmm. disaster? Absolutely. So, um, and the Where thing are with drones, you on that? So um, we are in the process of updating a consultant contract for our bridges because we actually don't have enough engineers to do bridge inspections. And so bringing consultants on, on board, I will have to check back in with that. But part of that is their ability to do drone assessment. And if you think about any disaster that has happened anytime lately, drones are just a part of it. But the most important thing with, with the drone assessment is it's, it's um, to be really useful, you kind of have to do a pre-flight, right. right? That's your yeah. baseline. And if you're looking at, and again, I'm not an engineer, if you're looking at LIDAR studies, you do a pre-flight and then it's easy for them to fly that same determined route and really determine um, what is not working. Right. So okay. we've used them a little bit um, small scale for things like internal inspections. Um, so still trying to, to figure out what that looks like. Um, working with, with consultants on that. And one of the ideas that you know I've, I've tried to get the city to consider is much like the auxiliary communication system is with volunteers who are very uh, capable and into their equipment is other cities have done the same thing with drone operators who are very experienced with their equipment. They're, they're volunteers who are embraced and um, they come under the auspices of the auxiliary communication system. Because the, the problem with doing contracts for um, inspections is can they get here? Whereas the people that actually live here, here would be. So it's not just us, um, all city departments are actually looking at the best way to use drone technology. Because again, it's not just about the bridges, it's the buildings and, and it's all the things. Um, so we are actively pursuing that. I will, I will have to check in on where we are with our, our latest contract. Uh, but I know that was a big part of it, something that I certainly was was pushing on that. Okay. That drone operator core, there's a really good um, there's a really good abbreviation for that. I don't know what it is, but it sounds like it could be a lot of fun. Something got good. several ACS members on the call here too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is it's like if we because we took it to buying them ourselves, but then what happens is you train people and then they leave, right? Right. Yeah. And then, or your equipment is no longer up to date and you're not familiar with it. So it really makes sense, much like the radio operators to, to um, enlist the people who um, are already awesome. certified, qualified, and, and they're, they are very familiar with their equipment to really get things done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, another question. After bridge inspections, how do inspectors get the information in? Do they so have was, to physically go back somewhere to report? So when I was talking about that universal application to report uh, damage assessment, okay. right now it's almost like a pen and paper situation with the radio, um, okay. which doesn't make sense, right? And that would take, take too long. So ideally uh, the Office of Emergency Management would have a group of um, damage assessment um, coordinators who as they're hearing from all the departments are, are um, putting that together and deconflicting, right. including the things that are coming from the public as part of the situational unit are putting all of that, that together. Um, other departments are doing it differently, but right now for, for us, it's pretty much radios and then like inspectors are doing things on, on paper. So we are actively aggressively working to try and get beyond that as quickly as possible and make it easier to do, including uh, most of the applications now, um, inspectors can do it on their phone and then even if there's no cell service, it saves it. And when cell service is available, it then gets um, uh, uploaded. It. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that all you had, Ann? Yes. Okay. And then Hugh? Uh, yeah, back to the drone things. I know, for instance, um, home inspectors are using them more and more. Mm -hmm. um, 
I didn't I didn't bother to learn it because I'm retiring. And uh, but you know it's groups like that that you could enlist. They already use it to go and assess buildings, so they they would know how to fly around it. Yeah. That. Yeah, that's, that's great. And again, too, that's that's good to know. And if they're in the area, we can get to them, um, uh, or they can get on the ground uh, quickly. Is important, but it's really useful again if you do that whole pre pre um, inspection. And I think that was that he was that your your comment. Did you yes. have a comment? Because yeah. that made me think of something that Cindy had asked too. Um, well, before you go too far away from that idea, um, yeah. So the you know. Um, SDCI and their mm -hmm. building official and their building inspectors, you know, mm -hmm. they've got they've got the wash was safe program where they can bring in volunteers to do that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you're talking with them to get over some of the issues of liability and how to use. Yeah, so that's a citywide that would be a citywide and state endeavor. So if any department is deals with liability, it's it's basically it's it it's it's a universal um, right. for the city. And we are lucky. I mean, we have a lot of major um, engineering companies in the area, and so um, it you know I fully expect that we will have a lot of uh, volunteers showing up to be able to do damage assessment. And it's really trying to one give them the right tools to be able to communicate quickly. And then you know what it is that we're we're asking for, like standardizing what 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 we what we need from them as right. well. And and their liability coverage. And their liability coverage, and that kind of um, made me think. Cindy, one of the questions you were talking about volunteers with equipment. Yeah. Oh, like good. Showed yeah. up. So um, one of the things, and again, in my incident, I, I uh, the state has a contract with the city to I to use my to use me um, when there's big disasters. So my incident management team. Um, was responsible. We were the second team in on the OSO slide. And one of the things that came out of that is, um, you know, the community that lived there had the equipment, were stepping forward and saying, we want to help. And at first it was like, no, you can't help. It's not safe. Um, and then it's like, well, they're doing it anyway. So we're going to let them do it. And then it's like, wait a minute. Now we need to really think about this more holistically because we're bringing in contractors and paying them. And here's an impacted community doing the same thing for free who actually needs, um, you know, to be compensated. Hey, Phil, can you mute, please? Never mind, I'll mute you. And so that that practice is now pretty pretty common with the ability to fold in um, volunteers as quickly as possible. And um, and I say that as quickly as possible because you still kind of have to go through and um, uh, if they have credentials, validate them. You know, validate whatever their equipment is, looks good, check them in you know, bring them into the fold, but that is certainly a part of, of uh, response efforts. And when we're talking about a major uh, catastrophic earthquake, if you think about um, the Oso slide, devastating, of course it was devastating, the loss of life, but that was one square mile and there's national federal resources that came in, many of them, right? So when you think about any response that we'll, 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 we are looking at is we will have um, federal assets that come into incident management teams um, and support teams who are, are um, experienced in incorporating, bringing on volunteers and making sure that they um, are, are safe, taken care of, compensated. I and, get, but um, that's talk day one. I yeah, got that, a guy well, that, with that, a bulldozer who just showed up at my hub and he wants to help. What do I do? So if your guy with a bulldozer shows up at day one, if it were me, I would say, I, um, that is wonderful. I am so glad I need your name and phone number right now. I can't safely give you something to do. Um, and we, and as soon as I hear, like, it, I mean, I would have people check back every day. So I so, talked about those boards too. We really can't have people showing up and saying, Hey, go do something. People will do it anyway. Don't get me wrong. Right. Cause that we will see stuff and want to do that, but it'll really be hard in the first day or a couple days to, to give good assignments that you don't know um, are safe for people to do. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to put, put, put you in a hub at a neighborhood and we yep. don't know how to get to the hospital, but yes. we found a road, but it's got rubble in it. And a guy mm -hmm. says, I got a little mini backhoe. I can yep. move that for you. So what we had worked with Ike, because we mm -hmm. had 
we were trying to write scenarios for an exercise and we were yeah. going like, God, we don't know what to do. And so we called Ike and he said, we should be at our rally points on day one. So if you've got someone with a substantial piece of equipment, we want to have a say in, in the priority use of that type of equipment. You right. Know? So, right. So send them to the rally point. Anybody with shovels and crap like that, you yeah. guys, you know, you show them the green gold map and say, go to work on the gold stuff, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so it, again, um, well, a couple of things on that is so the fire department is the lead agency and we're going to be look like working on their priorities. It's like, hey, what do you want us to do? Right. Right. And so the, the idea of rally points um, has not been fully developed. It is in the city's current earthquake plan. Um, and it's it's based around those rally points on um, uh, areas like Howler Lake is one of our service areas that has like a uh, there's a vacant lot next to it where we can say, hey, people can gather. And then and that includes city employees, too, who might not have an assignment or retired uh, government employees who would show up and, and get an assignment. I mean, it, it, that, that, that will take, that will take some time. Having said that, you know, I just told you all that I, I live in West Seattle and we know what the bridge stitch is like, we're going to be an Island. There's going to be a lot of islands. So we fully expect people, including myself, I will go to our West Seattle yard facility and I will set up our incident management, uh, team and I will, um, assign somebody or whoever the incident commander is specifically to um, coordinate volunteers who are coming in and, and figuring out what it is that we can do, um, how we can best use them. And it will probably be those first few days, uh, small things like that you can see like, hey, we can't even get into our yard, like <laughs> get our equipment in and out, right? You're, um, you're two blocks over your contract with some equipment. If you guys could even bring in your equipment and um, much like we treat snow, plow the debris to the side right. so that we can get to driveways, including the same thing for grocery stores or anything that you're trying to, to get to. It's, it's gonna be pretty basic at first. And I mean, when we treat debris, it's really, again, it's the same way we would treat snow is to try and push it to the sides so that we have a clear path in and out. So things like that are gonna be very, very um, simple at first, but also very necessary to even get things going. Um, and I'm a firm believer and I advocate this and I'm not the only one. Um, it is really important that the community has actions to do that are positive, right? It, 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 it's not only we need those resources, but as far as mental health and wellness and feeling like you have some control over what is going on, that is extremely important. And certainly um, part of um, SDOT's plans is to utilize all of the resources that we can not only just from the practical standpoint, but that it is, um, and that's how it started in Oso. It was like a mental, uh, very important for the people that lived there to feel like they were doing something for their family and loved ones. So um, we will do whatever we can to incorporate um, people. And so what I would say is for those who have equipment is yes, rally points or your closest city facility. Um, there are big ones, Haller Lake, that's a joint facility. It's not just SDOT. Um, Charles Street, that is a big joint facility. Um, and then there's smaller ones like the, the West Seattle Yard is that I would, I would absolutely tell people it's like, hey, once you're safe, your family's safe, you know, whatever resource it is, 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 is um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I would show up at, a, at the closest city facility and, and offer that um, with the understanding and expectation that it, it might take a little while to get an assignment. Um, but that 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 there has not been a response in decades that did not rely on volunteers and the communities to get things done fast and well. So I, we I think that's a, still a solid plan. We had Tom Richardson, who was one of the urban urban rescue teams mm -hmm. and a Seattle firefighter, mm -hmm. come talk to us about Oso, and which is why we find it so important to have these discussions ahead of time. The the information about send people with heavy equipment where you might might be concerned about their liability and you want to use them to the best priority of for everybody instead of just you know my neighborhood or something um by that, liability, lives in a, that lives in a bunch of people's brains right now and we've yeah. never written that down that's why we're doing this deep dive so that the new people mm -hmm. learn this and so there there was a request after some of the questions went past people that said, can we put this down sort of like that tip sheet thing that I sent you from Chad? 
Yeah. Yeah. So, and so then that Margaret's actually, got her hand up that actually is something that should not be addressed by SDOT. So that is something I need to take back to the Office of Emergency Management, and that should be a consistent in the city's response plan, right? Because it's not going to be just SDOT that needs stuff so that, that we're doing the same thing. Um, I, I totally agree with you. And I just want to say by liability, it's not so much that I'm worried that somebody's going to sue the city. I'm thinking about somebody goes out to do something to help and injures themselves or somebody else. Well, or so takes out a fire hydrant or, you know, yeah. other things. So, yeah, so. like the, the, the liability is like further down the road, it's more like safety of themselves and, and, and others, and then not actually causing more uh, problems, if you will, because they went and did something not understanding the, the, the bigger response efforts. Um, Margaret, you had a question? Yeah, I, well, wait a second, am I, yes, I do. I'm curious if there's a map of the city facilities that are rally points and also because of the lake, um, is there a rally point for when people say I have a boat or, you know, my boat, I, what, how can the, uh, somebody use our boats? You're talking about on Lake Washington? This, we're on Lake Union. On Lake Union, so no, I, there's not a, a rally point for um, boats, and you know, just because we just talked about city and state, any anything on the water is actually <laughs> it's the state and and the Coast Guard, right? <laughs> that have anything to do, um, but you will you will actually find people who, of course, will self deploy and figure figure things uh, out. There's oh, no doubt. <laughs> formally, formal at this point. So I know that in the city's earthquake annex, and again, that those rally points would not just be for SDOT, they would be for, for city departments. Um, there wasn't a map. They're working on adding one to those, those places. I think, let me write this down. The second thing I was going to look for the, well, actually a couple things, map of all bridges, the report we gave to city council, and I had asked this too, there is a map um, that, that I have seen of the rally points. So I will get that to you all. Okay. Yeah, they may be listed in one of the plans, but if Patty can find it for us, that would be- They, they are, but yeah. it's in the earthquake annex, they're separated. Cause that was my thing is like, hey, you talk about rally points and don't say where they are. And then in another part of the document, I mean, that just like, where's the map? And so there is one I did, I, I will just have to um, track, that, track that down. And then Margaret, Patty, one can of- you just for, Margaret, the other point about coordination with the Coast Guard, there is a series of workshops going on right now on the from the maritime, but they have not gotten down to citizen dealing with boats yet. They're still way up in the talking about major port stuff. So we're okay. waiting for that conversation to see where it goes. It is okay. coming around. Well, I mean, we're, our history is the Mosquito Fleet, right? Much like there's the Cajun Navy. And so we know that people will, will, uh, can and will do that, and that that would be an important asset. Hugh's um, got his hand up. Yes. Yeah. That, doesn't the fire department have uh, two points where they keep their fire boats? One on Lake Union. That would logically be the rally point. Um, I would I would be hesitant to say yes to that because if you get rally points there and they're trying to get their boats in and out, I'm not yeah. the fire expert. That might might Only cause. Yeah. That might cause problems. So I would hate to say that would be a natural um, rally point. I, I would really have to defer to them. You know, the police has the police also have rescue boats um, right. as well. So it, um, yeah. Yeah. Well. And I would actually, I, I think some of the people who have boats and and the maritime folks actually probably have a better understanding too of what are newer docks that they expect to actually um, survive survive and what are like our bridges some of them are a lot older uh and what would that what would that look like i mean if you were asking me just off the top of my head i would say um the wa the washington state ferries just did a lot of um work on updating the ferry system not where the big ferry boats are but the smaller ones for the water taxis right and that might be a, a natural place or argosy along the water um, on on elliott bay so looking at those those kind of places the other interesting thing too about Lake Union, um, not to just throw off all these other fun facts, is um, it actually has federal um, authority on there too because it's an airport, right? With those float planes. Oh, yeah. And so there's a whole other layer of regulation um, on there when you're talking about what can and cannot happen because um, it's a, um, not the navigable water, it, it, it's, it's, it's like an airport on water. 
We live in such a fun, interesting place. So other questions, folks, random while we're stopping or we'll go back to the list. Um, I think one of the nuanced questions was you talked about in, what you guys would do to inspect your bridges. Mm -hmm. The county is going to inspect their own bridges and the state is going to inspect theirs. And so are you all on the same like? page about how is the marking of open, closed bikes, peds consistent between the three of you or you can all have different methodologies? Some of it is an open, closed, and what does that look like? But anything in the city, yes, we would be, we would be consistent. So um, news to me and my department is in this uh, presentation Cindy mentioned in September, the state announced for the first time to us, here city, you are responsible for looking at all of your bridges. We're not going to get there. We have other stuff to do, <laughs> which is kind of cool. It's like, okay, but we have to actually formalize that because there are not only um, liability issues, but actually we can't actually get physical access to some of the things. So um, definitely we're following up with them on what that looks like. We also have for the South Park Bridge, which is a really important um, north-south connection coming out of the south and, and West Seattle and newer bridge. So we have a um, agreement with the county that we do um, maintenance on it already for them. And so part of the follow-up too with, with the county is, okay, we, we have this maintenance agreement, but in the event of an earthquake, we know that might not be your priority, it's gonna be ours. So we wanna take on the inspection of that. Um, and then consistently, yes, mark things. It would not make sense to have a bunch of different methods. Um, and I think one of the main things to really think about, cause there's a lot of like, oh, there's variables. I'm telling you like, I don't know, it's your neighborhood. One of the things that um, we we as a nation learned not only from 9-11 and then from Katrina and then from all of the disasters that happened um, from then is that we get better at response. And so we might, everything, every um, incident is unique and different, but when we have our, our um, system in place, when we have skilled people who use the incident management system, they know how to um, respond to set up response to bring in others to deal with volunteers to set up shelter and all other things like we are really good at that not only as, as a a city um but we just every we just get better what was it a few years ago when it was like one hurricane after the other after the other if you think about FEMA they only have about 2,000 full-time employees and the rest of it, they're like they're like the reservists. They call people up like myself and we go do things. And so um, we've gotten much, much better as a, a country um, since Katrina, in, including for me, that bookend of um, working with the federal response teams on OSO versus what had happened at Katrina was like night, night and day. So it's important to remember like, well, we don't always have all this, the specifics and there's always a what if. Um, the framework, which is why it's a national framework, um, we are really good at that. And that is something that you can feel solid about. And I feel comfortable um, about, again, my whole family also lives in West Seattle is that we, we are good about, we are good at that. And if nothing in the last few years, um, we've gotten even better about that, including um, having to do plans early on. Oh, and when um, COVID first started, um, our first cases, and we didn't know what it was going to look like. We didn't know how quickly it was going to move and how it would impact our workforce. And so as a city, we looked to doing um, plans down to 25% of, of our staff and how do we still deliver mission essential functions and all the departments did that. And so the work that was done for COVID, like looking at how we would do that with 25% staff, that work that we did that we were forced to do is the same work that we would use in an earthquake, right? Because we've already figured out if we only have 25% of our staff, and these are the very most important things, how would we get these things done? And so that, if nothing else, um, is, is the silver lining in, in COVID is that it forced the city departments to, to really come up with really tangible plans on how do we get things done if we potentially only had 25%. And then there were 50%. Unfortunately, it didn't come uh, to that, but we, we, we figured it out how we would do that. That, so I don't, I don't want to leave you with just like, I don't know, it's gloom and doom, don't take bridges. There's a lot of really good things that have happened recently. Well, but you would have to build on that because that is just everything's functional, nothing's hurt, nothing's damaged, and you can run with 25%. Now overlay that with 
you know, of course. You've, and got to, you've got to fix stuff, you know, and that's and where you kick in your contractor plan. I know and all that. We do. And we, we mapped our employees um, by their home zip code because anecdotally people say, oh, nobody lives in the city. It's too expensive. I kept hearing them like, I don't, I don't, where's the proof? What does that look like? So we um, mapped our employees by their home zip codes in the region so that we could get a good idea of who would be coming from the north, who would be coming from the south, like if, if this happened um, when people aren't at work. And then we, we added on to that what their job classifications were. Because you know if, if, um, if it's a uh, um, somebody who does payroll, that's super important or pays bills, but if we need somebody who's actually can pay the road, like those are different skills. So then we further mapped it by what their job classification was to get a good idea of what it would look like. And um, the good news is I was happy to see is we had a more even distribution of personnel and um, skill sets that lived um, around the city that could get to those rally points than um, I had really thought thought before. Cool. So we're, we were doing those things like thinking about that um, to really think about, yes, what would that look like? Yeah. And what, what resources can we expect? Yeah. Anne's got a question and I actually have another question. Mm -hmm. Um, so Patty, my, in my particular situation, my partner works in Beacon Hill and I live in North Seattle. The only way for him to get back home is across the canal, the ship canal. So, um, I, I looked at like the bridges that cross there and when they've been retrofitted and, and you've given me some information about mm -hmm. retrofitting is nice, but it really kind of depends on when the bridge first got put in place and, and of course and he'd be walking approaches, right he'd be walking yeah exactly yeah so I looked at I looked at when the bridges were retrofitted I looked at um, the liquefaction zone on either mm -hmm. end of the bridge yep. and I looked at like the cuts and and I, I, I need more guidance I so I did my best with figuring out what I could mm -hmm. but I the idea of just sitting tight and finding another way home is not an option for for my situation and probably a lot of other people's. So what are, what are the hazards I haven't figured out about telling my husband, frankly, to either find somebody with a boat or a canoe mm -hmm. or swimming mm -hmm. across the Mont Lake cut? And including that rumors that you would open the light rail tunnels to pedestrian traffic. Oh, is that an option, Patty? I mean, I... I can't speak to that. We don't manage the light rail tunnels. And if you think about, it's not just one tunnel. And I, I was talking about how some of those actually pass under those old bridges. So they're not new infrastructure. I, I really I really couldn't say if we could or, or oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about the new ones, the brand new ones. I was thinking about um, how they come into Soto, but you're talking about the new ones that we've done. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, all of the new ones that we have just built. You're the one I'm I still heard waiting. From, I'm still right? waiting for Link in West Seattle. I'll be retired. So I'm thinking of the old tunnels. But yes, we built a lot of new ones that other people in the city get to enjoy. Well, Margaret They've actually had a conversation with someone. And I can't. Yeah. So, Margaret, you tell yeah. that. Uh, I all I know is somebody in the neighborhood said they had learned, but I don't, you know, we're now <laughs> in a rumors <Yeah. laughs> level that <laughs> those those tunnels, the new brand new one um, between would be Husky Stadium and Capitol Hill mm -hmm. would be open or could be opened for um, people. The other thing that occurred to me, this is another place where it would be good to have the random boaters because mm -hmm. there are a lot of boats between, you know, next to the Montlake Cut, both sides, like Washington right. side and the right. Bay, where they could offer people rides back and forth. I mean, really need yeah. to organize. Same between East Lake and West Lake and South yeah. and South Lake Union. And as Cindy mentioned, that was something that the Coast Guard was looking at studying. And again, the um, new uh, 99 tunnel is one of the most solid structures in the city. And if you think about it, it's actually two tunnels on top of each other. You could mm -hmm. easily see a point where um, one could be for pedestrian and and bikes and so forth, and then the other the top layer or other layer could be split north north south, or one could be for emergency vehicles. But but yeah, I mean those are those are certainly be be options. Um, and as far as to what to did we lose did we lose Anne? No, nope, still here. Okay. Um, oh, there you are, right in the center. You for some reason it, it moved. Um, as far as what what to tell your husband, and again, I think that. Um, 
that when you come up to structures and you can um, you can see that you can actually access them by 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 foot. Yeah. You know, it's very different than a, than in a, in a car situation. Um, and then and you just kind of looking to see what's going on. And some of it is honestly just going to have to just kind of be common sense. I will tell you, though, that people like whether it's the, the boat operators, people are extremely um, inventive creative. and creative. And so a lot of the best responses and things come out of um, what happens when there's a disaster and there's a void and people sit around like, hey, I can figure this out. We're just going to go do this, and it starts, and then it, and then it gets formalized, right? Like, oh, that's a great idea. We're going to incorporate incorporate you um, into that. I think the most important thing that I would say to um, everybody, you're talking about walking home, as I tell people this all the time at my office, is you really have to make sure that you have really good shoes at your desk. And for me, it's my old running shoes that I can't run in anymore. But they have a good, they're still good for that. And I had to use them a couple of weeks ago and I pulled out my running shoes. It's really important that you personally have like um, good Ooh. shoes and even outerwear. So if you are walking home, like you can do that. Yeah. Um, that is I just really wanna, important. I want to be able to tell him to head to either west of five or east of five. Don't delete it. I, and, and it sounds like east of five. And, and Patty, can we follow up with you and get an answer to maybe the plans for the light rail tunnel? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly um, follow up with my, um, uh, the emergency manager at um, Sound Transit and ask okay. her what her thoughts are. You um, know, Patty, what, what all of us specialize in is what you just said, but let's not wait till we actually have it. And then we go, oh, yeah. here's the inventive answer. We kind of run through these scenarios when we do our annual exercises and it forces the conversation that says gap in knowledge, you know, so let's go dig out what might be the most likely. And we've lived through cycles where we did one answer, we tested and we went, hey, maybe not so good, you know, and the city works with us, the different departments <laughs> to go, yeah, no, that that was a really good notional idea, but maybe we should tweak it a little bit. Yeah. So. The so more we can do in advance, because we all think of we're going to be standing at our hub locations one day after this exercise, after the event, you all are working and we're standing there trying to best guess what to what do. The plan that is going to be executed, right? Yeah, I will and certainly we can say, listen, you know, the plan is that they will run trains or that it'll turn into pedestrian. Listen to the radio and we'll try and get the right answer yeah. for you. Um, I will certainly follow up with them. I'd be curious what they would have to say. Um, I have a guess what they will say. <laughs> and well, um, my guess I, is going to be with that they will say, no, it's dangerous, but here's what will happen. People are going to do it anyway. People are going to yeah. do it. And then they're going to say, yep, we're going to, we're going to embrace it. It's yep. kind of like that liability thing ahead of time, but certainly, I, I, you know, them thinking about it and knowing if it's feasible and having having the strategy, whether they they would come out and probably say, "Yep, we're going to do that." I, I don't I don't know, but yeah. it's definitely if they I'm sure they probably have already thought about it because they attend community meetings and talk to people um, um, as well. But you all have been doing this. I mean, yeah. you you know, it's kind of like that. We can't say we're going to do it and say go ahead, but it's going to happen. And um, yeah. Yeah. So, but I will absolutely ask uh, Lori, Liz, Lori Brisbane is their emergency manager and okay. ask her. Thank you. Um, I had one question, to, a couple things. It, um, one of the questions you started to answer, which was the Bailey Bridges. In the mm -hmm. past, we had been told one, it kind of like the Fremont, because that's the only place the roadbed comes down low enough. So mm -hmm. that would be the one north-south connector. Yep. And then the second one was kind of down by Boeing Field because that's- in That's small point. Yeah, yeah there's another little bridge there. Mm -hmm. Low enough and below the yeah. you know traffic ways where they could put it in. Yeah. But then what I heard you say is you guys had not finalized with the Coast Guard that that was- It's not even the Coast Guard. Operation. So I had heard that too and seen maps. I could never actually find like where, what made them acceptable so we can identify those so but what happens to happen is not just it's the actual um those things will come in off the it's the navy that's actually looking at them with the corps of engineers and the coast guard and so they actually are looking at um things like 
if there's a tidal influence, like say on the Duwamish, soil conditions, width. And so that's what they'd actually gotten to in Oregon that they had just started doing here that was supposed to be practiced and identified for Cascadia 2022. Um, and I was excited about that because again, the more we have those identified in agreement, the better off we are. Well, that's a bummer um, I, because that was what we heard in Cascadia 16 and that we have gone six years and haven't made a decision. It's like, holy crap. Well, it's not our decision. It's like we potentially said, yeah, this will be good. Um, there's a thing, and I know we're, gonna, we're running out of time. It's called DISCA, the, the defense, um, civil defense. It's basically where the, the federal assets, the military assets come in and then they help. Um, and so every year that they have a conference and the last conference I went to here, we were still in person. Um, this, I think it's the sixth fleet that we would be bringing in things to. It's like um, they can have agreements, just being frank here and, and, and all transparency and identify places. They're responsible for like the whole, like Guam, Hawaii, like so much. And so they can never, they can never guarantee where any of their stuff is going to be at any given time and what the priorities are. So, so the more, just to say, we're not ever going to get bridges. I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think that that, that is true. Um, you will always see things like um, international resources too that, that come in. So the more groundwork that is done, it has to be our federal partners who have said, yep, this works, we've agreed, we've checked these things, it meets our standards, we can plunk a bridge down, here's what it is. And I will follow up because that was something, work that was supposed to be done and um, kind of practice for, for Cascadia. And I don't know what happened to that. Okay. Um, so I'm, I, I'm very curious about that as mm -hmm, too. Uh, one of the other questions on the list, yeah, and I just looked and I went, oh my God, we ran past eight. So hang on guys, we'll try and finish this off. Um, do you, what about traffic? You know, when we, we know our cr people cr are crazy when the lights go out, you know, nobody teaches yep. four-way stop safety. Right. What, what about the question of how are we going to work, you know, are it, there's not enough law enforcement to go out and deal with the traffic situations, but you can just imagine what that Myers Way Highland Park intersection is going to look like with no traffic. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's kind of what we ran into with the light rail situation on MLK and Olson, uh, I think it was Olson, because um, it was a very complicated intersection. I think it's, it's really unrealistic to think that there are going to be people out directing traffic at any of those locations, just from a resource um, perspective. And certainly as we're identifying priority routes for um, uh, emergency response and, and, and hubs and points of distribution, we will make those as safe as possible with um, traffic control devices, anything that we can do to make them um, as safe as possible. That said, those are, those are gonna be, you're looking at like static stop signs. And we deployed those um, in the last weekend and some of them got blown over, people were ignoring them. So uh, realistically, I mean, I, I think a lot of that is, is, is a human process problem, not an engineered problem. And it's completely unrealistic to think that, that there will be people um, out in those intersections. That said, again, we will make as safe as possible any of our priority routes with any signs or any of the tools that, that we have in our arsenal um, to make sure that they are as safe as possible. And that, and that people know like, hey, this is the priority route that we've identified um you know it might be wild west and the, and the other ones but this is this is what we we focused on and we will do everything that we can to make those identified routes as safe as possible and maybe one of the standing messages that you guys can start messaging immediately is four-way stop behavior yeah i mean we did it last weekend washdot did it too we do that every single time we lost power in west seattle today um signals were out that is always a uh, constant Okay. reminder and washdot amplifies us and and we wash uh, we amplify washdot um i guess the only perk if you will is if you're talking about something like a catastrophic earthquake where there's a lot of um rubble debris. and different <laughs> debris and things and just a lot to see and people are tired and i mean that's like big traffic calming yeah, that's true. But in some ways, heads right? up everybody, new injects coming, you know, on your whiteboards, right? You know, four-way stops, everything. I mean, people are, they're just going to be driving slower. They're going to be looking around. It's going to be like, what's going on? Or I'm afraid to drive. And um, so it's not going to be like a commute or Friday, Friday evening 
uh, people trying to get in and around the city. What yep. about what about gorilla stop signs? You know that oh, I gorilla. just make one. Yeah, and put and put it up. I mean, does S dot really care? Um, I can't say that we do. Wouldn't care. No, that wouldn't happen. I mean, you um, people, would. You would. For example, care, in, but... in, in a snow response, people close hills and open hills all the time. Yeah. Um, which aren't things that we have done. And it is a, is a constant thing because sometimes it's a safety issue because people open a hill to go sledding and then they just shoot right through an intersection. So I cannot say that we wouldn't care about it. And again, what I would say is on those routes that we've identified as a priority, we would be very diligent to make sure that all of the proper traffic control was in place and that there weren't those things going, going on. Um, but, you know, uh, People do creative stuff all the time. Again, we would just be focusing. We would have to focus on our priority routes. And then certainly if there was a, a, um, a, a significant problem, um, we would obviously try and address it and triage it as soon as possible. I got two left. One is the big flood, the, you know, if the Ballard locks get yes. breached. Yes, <laughs> so I'm glad you mentioned that. So I followed up with the, um, that is actually the Army Corps of Engineers. I actually talked to their public affairs person this morning and he was a little like, huh, I know we've done some work. I know there's some seismic studies. And I said, yes, and I would like it for my meeting tonight. And he said, pause, and he's like, I will work on it. I did actually have a physical conversation with him this morning. Um, I have his name and phone number, so I will expect him to, I did some Googling and can see that they did some seismic work in 2016. I would expect that he will get back to me. Um, and I will certainly, Cindy, share, share that with you to share out. And I got curious too. It was like, I want to know, but yeah, I felt yeah. great. I actually talked to somebody this morning who called me back at 8.05 and was like, okay, I'm going to look into that for you. <laughs> and I, and yeah. I believe that he will. Our hub captains and the people who asked that on the very creative thinkers. So yeah, well, it was a good question. I didn't know. So I was yeah. like, okay. The last we'll we'll wait to hear from me on that then. The last question I had is that when Cascadia Rising 2016 happened, mm -hmm. we uh, we had about six hub representatives go into the different departments uh jigs. Mm -hmm whatever operation center pox sure. or whatever they're called department right. operation centers yeah so we went to SDOT, we went to spu uh, we went to oem and there was i think one more so be, we don't know what's going to happen in 2022 but if you guys actually have an exercise day or two I, i'm not putting you on the spot to answer right yeah. now but we we'd like to do that again with some of our new hub captains so you know yeah. The more people understand what the city does and can really relate that into expectations or stop bad expectations, that mm -hmm. is really important. So if you would consider allowing us to be part yeah. of your exercise, that would be great. Um, so our exercise, we're, will we, whatever the, we're trying to figure out what the city is doing and to make the most out of it. So there will be limited play from the state and the federal partners. So we are trying to figure out like still, how do we get the most out of it? So it's not an S dot exercise, right? And, um, and for sure, I mean, one of the things like we've had the um, auxiliary communication folks come and sit in our department operations center. And that was really helpful in test messages. So absolutely anything that, that we can do um, in that exercise that could simulate something that we'd really want and to involve you all, I would be happy to do that. That would be great. Okay. So um, we ran a little long. I just want to like highlight the things that are on my follow up to do. So um, one of them is I'm going to look for that report we gave to council on the bridges um, last year. Two, a map of all bridges. Three, a map of the rally points. And then I'm going to follow up with the sound transit on the tunnel issue. And then the last one was to find out where we were with our federal partners um, on moving towards identifying and approving appropriate sites for Bailey Bridges. I'm so glad you did that. I'll go back and get it off the transcript. But, and then the fourth, the fifth thing was the uh, Ballard Locks. Oh yes, and the Ballard Locks, yep. And that Patty, would be fantastic. Yeah. One last thing, you mentioned the Lifeline map. 
you know, coming down yeah. from Everett and going on 405. Yeah. Do you have a map of that? So that is a, um, that might be on one of the things the city has. This. So that is a WashDOT lifeline map where they connect the whole city. I mean, pardon me, the whole state. So um, there are, um, and if you don't have it, Cindy, I can write that, write that down too. If you, first one to find it, because now Anne asked me in the chat and my brain was concentrating yeah. on other stuff. And, and so, and it, it connects it's like probably in the Moses, Cascadia Rising presentation. Yeah, it's like connects Moses Lake. It, it's the whole kind of how, a big circle basically um, around the state uh, to move resources in and out. So yeah, I will write that down. I have a good good colleague there at WashDOT. Okay, this was fun. This I hope you great. got. I hope you guys learn learn things. It certainly got me thinking. Again, I, I always wish I had like more specific answers. There's just so many variables, and really, it's it's knowing again, like we're talking about thinking about it, but knowing that we have that um, that structure, that incident command structure in place. Um, not just us, but all of our partners from across the country that'll come in to help that, 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 that we can seamlessly um, fold them into our operations should, should, it gives me some comfort. So I hope it gives you some comfort um, too. And again, it's like anytime anything happens disaster wise, you just see these great ideas and things that, that come out of it that people hadn't thought of. Um, and it's like the, the, the uh, necessity is the, whatever the, Motherhood's invention. Rock. That's right. Yes, from Schoolhouse Rock. Yes, that yeah. one. Yes, it totally, totally is is yeah. true. And we'll follow up with you about how we might document some of these things so that as we bring on new hub captains, they have yeah. that information already available to them instead of somebody sitting down and remembering to tell them about Bailey Bridges or something. So fantastic. What would be, what would be great to um, make sure that this doesn't get lost in my um, things of all the things too is if you want to invite me to, if it's not the next meeting, but the one after, where I can actually report out on all of these things. Yes, Our, we generally do two deep dives in a row. You may not be the whole program next time, but we'd have you back. Yeah, and I don't know if it next time, I mean, cause we're starting to hit the holidays. I mean, I'll certainly work on it, but definitely I wanna come back um, before the end of the year to a meeting and report yeah. out on all of the things that I found out. It would be December, second Tuesday in December. Okay. Is that, so it's a full month away. Is that enough time, do you think? It should be. What is the date of that? I just want to write it down. Uh, the, 14th. December 14th. 14th. Okay. Yeah, I will put that on my calendar. Um, so that is definitely, um, I should be able to get most of the information. And if not complete answers, then then updates on on um, where we are with that, including like the, the Bailey Bridges and what the anticipation is for that and the Cascadia exercise for sure. Fantastic. And I'll be happy to come back and, and talk to you guys about that. Great. Thank you so much. Good night, all right. everybody. Thanks, everyone. It was nice to great meet you. Great job, all. Patty. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. That was great. Bye, y'all.